Welcome to the Bunny Knit Nighty Sew Along. This is a pattern that um, has been around for several years and then a couple of years ago when it was time for reprinting we went ahead and made a few changes. Um, uh, there's a little bit of a change in the sizing and there is an extra size in here that wasn't in the original one. But if you have the original pattern that's just fine. You can still sew right along with this. You will need your pattern. You will need, uh, we're gonna do the applique. We're gonna actually applique the bunny on there. So if you've never done that before, this might be a good time to try. And if you do that, you will need a little bit of heat and bond or steam a seam because you will need to um, fuse that bunny on the front of the gown. So you'll also need, I'm gonna put a white, um, a white bunny on this blue gown. So I have a little piece of white fabric. You will need, for your applique process, you'll need a tearaway for the back of the gown. And um, to tell you the truth, I often just use um, copy paper. But if you have actual tearaway like this, you can use that too. Um, you will need all your sewing supplies. Um, go ahead and use a uh, ballpoint needle or a uh, needle that's for knits with this gown. So when you are looking at your, the back of your pattern and you're looking at the fabric requirements, if you have not bought your fabric yet, if you will purchase an extra quarter of a yard, I'm going to show you how to get two gowns for the price of one and just a little bit more. So if you haven't gotten it, think about that. But either way, don't cut your fabric yet. Go ahead and watch the next segment and you can see how um, we can fold and refold and actually get two gowns if you buy just a little more fabric. And that's not, that's not me trying to sell more fabric. It's just that um, that's all it takes to be able to get two gowns out of um, just a little more than what the pattern calls for. So I'll see you back in just a little bit. Okay, now you can see that I've unfolded my knit and I'm refolded just over far enough that this um, gown, this happens to be the back, it doesn't matter whether it's the back or the front, but this first gown piece is placed on fold and I've just folded enough so that the bottom edge um, is just almost on the edge of the fabric. I went ahead and trimmed off the selvage um, and that way I, I wouldn't by accident get a little bit of selvage in the corner of the gown. So after you've done that, then um, we're gonna do some refolding and flip the pattern piece. So keep all of your gown pieces up here and that way you still have this fabric um, for the sleeves. So now still folding um, with the grain of the fabric. It really isn't a grain, but um, you still want to fold straight. It's just that now you have this um, angle here from the first gown piece. And so now you can take advantage of that and flip the next piece. So if you have a fabric that has a print and it um, has a one direction to it, you can't do this. This is just for solids or prints that are scattered and um, don't have a definite direction to the print. So I'm gonna go ahead and pin this one on and cut it out. And then we will be back with the next fold. So now I've got the front of my gown folded and cut. So now we're ready to fold again. Keeping the fabric straight. 
And now we're gonna switch back to the back. So we can fold this a little bit more this way. So I'm gonna cut this out. That'll give me two backs. And then you see that I've got enough here then to refold one more time and get a second front. And then we still have um, your extra fabric down here for your four sleeves. So you're gonna be able to get two gowns instead of just one. Now, before you take your pattern pieces off of your fabric, there's just a few things you need to mark. Um, there's a little placement line up here, that little V. You need to just mark a dot or a line there. And then on the other side, that's the only thing for the sleeve. And then for the back, back on here. There's a little placement line right here. So you need to mark that on both the left and right side of the back. And then the same thing on the front. Mark that. Mark it on the other side. And then the front and the back are very, very similar. So um, I usually just go ahead and either mark the front or the back just to remind me. So, and this is our front. And we are going to talk about our applique. So I'm just going to put a little mark here. I still have my my, my front uh, gown uh, folded. So I'm just gonna mark that to know that that's the center. Um, and that will help in when we're placing the um, applique on there. So I went ahead and traced my bunny on my heat and bond or steam -a seam whichever you are using. And then I fused it to the wrong side of the fabric that um, I'm going to be using. And um, the next thing you will do then is cut on the line all the way around and then you'll be able to peel that paper off and then we'll be ready to um, position and fuse the bunny in place. So get your bunny, um, fused on and get everything trimmed and peel that paper away and then we will be back for the next step. Okay, so I've taken the paper off the back of my bunny. Um, I went ahead and continue the detail of the of the lines for the bunny's ear and um, uh, along its back so that I can continue that satin stitch line there and that will give it a little more detail. So now I've got my center marked as far as this way. Um, and what I did is I went ahead and jumped to step two, which is pressing the neck edge a half an inch. And I did that so that I could um, visualize exactly where my bunny should go. Uh, it's easy to get it too close to the top of the neck edge if you haven't pressed that first. So I like to do that. And then um, I'm thinking about right here. And you, you can just kind of eyeball that. But that looks good. So I'm just gonna press him down. And then I want to talk a little bit about the applique before we go to the machine. Remember I said you will need um, some stabilizer tear away on the back. Also, um, 
I'm going to, now that I've gotten know where my bunny is, I'm going to cut a piece of baby interfacing, just a little bigger than that area, and fuse that on so that um, my knit won't stretch as I'm sewing. And then I'll also have the tear away under um, the fabric and the um, fusible interfacing. So when you applique, you need a foot that has a nice big groove in it here. And what that does is it allows your satin stitch to um, glide smoothly rather than get bunched up if that groove wasn't there. Or that It's kind of like a big ditch. Um, and then this one is an open toe applique foot, which is great because it gives you more visibility. Sometimes uh, they're clear and that's good too. So you will need, um, you will need this foot or a foot similar to this. And then um, your tension, your top tension on your machine, you need to turn that down a little bit. So my top tension is typically at four and I will turn it down to three. And what that does is, your stitch is no longer balanced. So ideally, when you're stitching at your machine, you want your stitch balanced. And so you want the bobbin thread and the needle thread to meet at the fabric. Well, we want the needle thread to actually go underneath the fabric a little bit, and it'll make a smoother, prettier um, satin stitch. So, um, so you, you might want to just play around with that a little bit before you actually start on, um, appliquing your bunny. And then the stitch length is going to be, um, probably 0.5, but there again, um, play around with your machine and get a stitch look that you like. And then the stitch width, because this is a small applique, the stitch width is only going to be a two. If this were a bigger applique, it might be a three and sometimes even a four width, but we're going to do a two. Okay, so I've been stitching on my applique. I did uh, go ahead and fuse the um, lightweight baby interfacing just under where the bunny is, and then I have my tear away. I uh, ended up choosing a width instead of two. It's kind of in between two and 2.5. Um, it just needed to be a little bit wider because you need to be able to do the satin stitch with your needle swing off the applique and then back on the applique. And so if it gets to be too narrow, then it's hard to do that without maybe having some fuzzies along here or uh, maybe not catching enough of the applique. So I did bump it up a little bit and... Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about curves and points. So when you're going around an outside curve like this, you'll stop and pivot from time to time and you need to stop with your needle on the outside. So just think of it this way. If it's an outside curve, you stop with your needle on the outside when you need to pivot. If it's an inside curve or in an inside point like that is, then you'll stop with your needle on the inside right there above the point uh, and then pivot. And so I'm going to continue stitching here, um, and then um, we will move on. Um, so I'm going to stitch, and you can hopefully um, see that I go slow, and that I stop and pivot every once in a while so that I can have a curve, uh, a smooth curve.
So I'm going to finish here. And um, and then when I get to this point, I will come back and show you um, what I do right there. Okay, so I'm at that point, that inside point. It's just like this one over here. And so I've got my presser foot up and now I'm going to pivot so that I can continue um, from that point to go around the next part of the curve. So I'll finish this up and then we will continue with the construction. So I've been finishing out my bunny. Um, I didn't have any narrow 1 8 inch ribbon so I just made uh, with embroidery floss just made a couple lazy daisy um, stitches and straight stitches to make a bow and then just a couple straight stitches for um, for his eye. Um, after that, the next thing you're going to do is um, you're going to press the edges of your sleeves um, and your neckline of both your front and your back. And you will um, be stitching just a zigzag from the wrong side so that you can see the edge. And it's a zigzag stitch of three for the width and two for the length. Um, so you'll want the zigzag to go off of that raw edge of the, of, uh, the folded edge and then back onto the fold. And you'll do that on both the front, the back, and the sleeves. And then you'll be ready for the shell stitch. The shell stitch is just a blind hem stitch. And the stitch width on that is four. And the stitch length is one and a half. Um, that could vary, so be sure and practice on a scrap first. Um, and then you're gonna need to turn your tension up. I. Um, I had to turn mine up to about seven and a half. So it's normally on um, four. And um, I had to turn it up to just a little past seven. And I think that's just gonna vary depending on, uh, depending on your machine, but also depending on the thickness of your knit. Um, so you definitely need to practice on a scrap. But what you're going to do is if you have a, um, a mirror image um, option, you'll choose that. That way, when you're stitching, this folded edge is gonna be near this side of your presser foot. If you don't have a mirror image, what you will need to do is just flip your sleeves and your uh, neckline over so that you can still get that shell stitch but you, um, it'll be maybe a little bit awkward because it's kind of opposite of what you would normally sew. Um, and what happens is on a blind hem stitch, you have, um, it will stay, it will, excuse me, it will uh, uh, do a straight stitch for, um, I just turned my, new, my mirror image off instead of on. Um, it'll do a straight stitch and then it will swing off to the right and you need for it to go off the fabric when you do that. And the reason you need your tension tightened is you need for that needle thread to grab uh, the bobbin thread and that's what causes the, um, the shell edge to form. So it's important that you uh, your needle swings off the fabric, but just barely off the fabric. So I would work on that for a while before you start on your gowns. And then um, if it gets a little wavy, and it probably will, if you will just uh, take your steam iron and uh, steam that edge, it'll, it'll uh, bounce right back. So you've got um, all of those edges to do and then we will be back to start the construction. Now we're ready to move on to step, step five. So um, what we're doing is we're overlapping the shoulders and the back overlaps the front. Um, one thing to be sure of uh, is that this is the right side of your fabric. 
because now you do have a wrong side because you have that edge that you zigzagged down. And um, you'll be able to see when you're doing this that it's really, it, it's easy to um, not realize you're putting the, the um, wrong side up instead of the right side up because I just about did that. So make sure this is the right side and this is the right side. So essentially you're putting the wrong side of the back of the gown to the right side of the front of the gown and you're overlapping and that's where these marks come in that you um, uh, uh, transferred from your pattern. And um, you want those to meet just like that. Um, I think this is a nice size neckline for a six month, a six to 12 month. But um, if you know the baby you're sewing for has maybe more than one chin, um, you can shift this a little bit, not very much, but instead of um, matching the dots, you could um, move the um, um, back of the gown toward the back a little bit. So instead of them matching, they could be about an eighth of an inch apart. You don't want to do it very much or your sleeve won't fit. But there's a little bit of playroom, not a lot, but just an eighth of an inch can make um, a good size difference. It would make uh, about a half an inch difference. So um, if you know your little baby is got a, two or three chins, then you might want to move it just a little bit. So I'm gonna put a pin and, mark, and match those dots. And then over here, that point needs to stay along the edge of the armhole. If, you, um, if you're not careful, when you go to stitch, you could stitch it in such a way that that point sticks out after you uh, are putting your sleeve on. So um, put another pin right there to hold that point in place. And we're gonna go ahead and baste this first. So um, just leave that pin there till you get it uh, stitched in place. And then same way on this side, make sure that point goes all the way to the edge of the armhole. So I'm gonna put a couple more pins in there. I have gone ahead and done that on this side. So now I'm ready for the sleeve. So this is my arm hole. And then again, make sure that um, you have the right side down. So right sides together for your sleeve as well. And usually what I like to do is put a pin here. And put another pin matching that shoulder line again with that purple line or that your, sh your shoulder line on your armhole. Your lines may not be purple. And then another one back at the beginning of the armhole. And then you can go through and put one or two more pins to hold everything in place. And then this will be stitched with a slight zigzag. So 0.5 for the width of the zigzag. And, um, and then for the length, it is 2.0. And that will give um, that stitch just a little bit of stretch. Okay, so I'm ready to stitch this on. After I do, um, I'm going to serge this edge. If you don't have a serger, you can just trim it neatly and stop at that, or you could trim it a little bit, you know, to, just to clean it up, and then um, use a zigzag to finish it, or one of your other um, stitches on your machine that you like to use for finishing seams. So, so I've got that done, and I'm gonna stitch it on and get that seam finished, and then we'll be back. Now I'm ready to put right sides together. And so the whole um, um, underarm seam of the sleeve as well as then continuing all the way down um, the edge of the gown. So um, 
I won't do a whole lot of pinning, but I will put a pin right here at the beginning so that um, that doesn't shift and makes for a nice edge there. And then I'll put another one here at the uh, uh, section where the, the sleeve um, underarm seam meets and I'm going to press that seam toward the sleeve. And then that's probably all the pinning I'll do. Um, and then after that, um, I did this side and I went ahead and surged. And to, um, you can just cut that surging off if you want, but I'm always afraid it's going to fray a little bit. Um, and some people will take like a, um, a large needle like this and thread the, um, serger tail through the needle, eye of the needle, and then um, thread that tail up among some of those uh, serger threads. So you can do that. Um, what I like to do is just pull that serger thread back um, onto itself and then just do just a um, short little straight stitch right there and then uh, trim off the rest of the tail and that'll keep it from uh, fraying or raveling as well. So after you've gotten your side seams done and and surged or finished, then the next step is to go to the bottom of the gown and you're gonna press it up a half an inch just like you did the sleeves and the neck edge. And, um, and then you'll do that zigzag that um, is, I think it's three for the width and two for the length. And then if you like, you could go ahead and do a shell stitch here again. I really, I think the shell uh, stitch is very sweet. Um, also, you have the option of doing, just hemming it like I said, and leaving a one inch opening. And you can run elastic through there and um, cinch it in at the bottom with the elastic. I think it's about uh, 13 to 15 inches of elastic um, at the bottom. I like to just leave it um, open and I think it's less likely to kind of um, work up their little bodies when they start squirming um, in bed. So, and I think it's, I don't know, I just like it better. So, um, but that is just totally personal preference. So I'm gonna finish up and, um, and then we will uh, talk at the very end. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the Bunny Knit 90. They make the sweetest gifts, and as I guess you probably know by now, they don't take very long. And um, for a gift, it's nice to go ahead and make a coordinating uh, bib. So if you were to applique the bunny in a print, then, um, then you could make the bib out of that same print. The bib can be made in a knit or a woven, so you've got a lot more choices with that. But, I'm telling you, these little girls love these gowns and I'm so thankful that they go, this pattern goes to a 20, 24 month because I promise you they'll be squeezing themselves in that gown long past that 24 month period. See you next time.